Welcome back to CXO Revolutionaries. I'm your co-host, Ben Fanning. This is brought to you by Zscaler. We've got a treat coming your way today with Ryan Steelberg, who is CEO and president of Veritone, the leading artificial intelligence and cognitive service provider. Ryan and his brother, Chad, co-founded DeMar Broadcasting and grew to 4,600 U.S. broadcast stations or 4,600 U.S. broadcast stations. And then it was acquired by Google. And prior to that, they co-founded AdForce, forming the world's largest ad tech platform. Ryan, welcome to CXO Revolutionaries. Great to be here. Appreciate the time today. Man, so pumped to have you with us today. So start this out by telling us what is Veritone and why did you and your brother found it in the first place? You know, we we grew up really in the ad tech space, um, and and you know what what that means for us is where there was ever a place to serve an ad online on a website, a banner ad, or an interstitial or a preview ad before you're watching a video. Um, you know, we we collectively done a great job of oversaturating that, um, and just give you a kind of an interesting metric. You know, prior to 1995, the average American saw about 35 to 40 unique commercials a day. And then it kind of hit a peak of over 3,600, right? Just over, I mean, I mean, now it's been over like 15 years ago. So when you have the horsepower, when you have the n- enough eyeballs coming to the web and then transition to the mobile phone, and then it's all IP based with personalization, as you know, we've been kind of oversaturated. Um, it, it was great for business um, and even through Google, we then, um, it was really the mobile phone. So when the mobile phone it, when the screen real estate shrunk, and I couldn't serve banner ads and everything around the content, um, you know, we started to look at potential branding and marketing opportunities inside the content. I call it the, old, the oldest form of advertising, right? Product placement, right? The very first television show yeah. ever on air, right? Didn't have a commercial break. It was sponsored by, right? And they weave it into the programming. So we, so in short, we we transition from I'd say building a, a, a great career and great technologies for. Um, display-based type of advertising to shifting over and saying, how can we do this? How can we start to analyze what's inside the content, right? When a logo mm-hmm. appears in the background of a sporting event, when the, yeah. the, the when the talk show host is organically talking about Geico, right? And it's not a commercial break. Um, and you know, we, we, we fundamentally knew that it was very valuable real estate, but we needed to break it down, analyze it, and, and you know, I'd say empirically look at what's working, what's not working. Could I look at product placement or branded integrations with the same efficacy and resolution that I could display-based ads? And so you know, that, that was really the, the kernel of an idea for Veritone was okay. you know, we started, it was an ad tech problem we were trying to solve um, before we sort of expanded into many different areas of what we're doing today. But the problem set was, um, ironically, could I find um, when Rush Limbaugh is on every radio station in the United States for a while, his, he was the main ambassador behind LifeLock. I remember if you remember that brand. And he had the most amazing storytelling ability to, to endorse a brand. But there's no software in the world. We were like, we got to use AI. It? How can I measure it? How can I even know that this, his, his conversation, his, his story about going to Cabo on vacation somehow turns into credit card and secu- you know, right and, and you know credit card and security prevention okay. fraud pr- fraud yes. prevention okay that's the software we sent out to build and and so we, um, this is now 2012 when we kind of launched our first prototype of using AI cognitive services to analyze audio and video at scale and seeing if I could identify that without humans so right. you play the audio in different ways, like on this Rush Limbaugh example, you would you would play it in different ways, and then you would test the results based on where and how it appeared. Well, that's I think or, that's downstream. First is okay. we just needed to understand we needed to be able to find when in near real time he that he was talking about LifeLock, and so mm. for, now it's kind okay. of now it's kind of table stakes. But back then, we had to analyze thousands of audio streams and then using AI to index it, put it into structured format, like speech to text. Um, and you know, back then, the accuracy of a lot of the AI models was so poor, so we, it forced us to start to build a lot of our own early iterations of AI models, primarily initially to focus in, uh, primarily on audio. Um, so what you just described is once you have the resolution, once I can verify what they're talking about in context, 
then I could start to do A-B splitting and saying, hey, listen, you've got to bring your sponsorship dialogue to the front of the narrative, right? We're seeing a much higher return and impact on the advertising to the consumer base versus you dropping it at the tail at the end, right? Simple. So how far along is this technology now? I mean, it's advanced, I mean, it's advanced a ton. Yeah. Um, you know, now we, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, you know, programmatic transcription, right? Taking audio, spoken word, and turning it into text format. But now, you know, us working with AWS, our partner, you know, we service, we can analyze content now with like 25 different categories of cognition. So object detection, logos, faces. Um, so think of it just, you know, now if I want to do, you know, a multivariant query such as, you know, bring me all the footage um, over the last 25 years where Michael Jordan's face is on screen and there's a Nike logo in the background and the announcer mentions Nike, okay? So think of that multivariant okay. query. Now you can, you know, that's, that that's what we can do now. So we've been able to index all this content with speed oh. and accuracy, and that's powering a lot of media workflows today, all, all different use cases, but fundamentally that's it. Ingest lots of content, use AI to interrogate it, analyze it, and then have a, a platform that I can turn that into value, right? Whether it's for programming or advertising yes. optimization or whatnot. So where is the best place to put a podcast advertisement? It's absolutely in the first 10 minutes of a show. People sometimes will skip and fast forward through the beginning. So you, you see a lot of habits podcasters will introduce, hey, you know, just thanks for today's show brought to you by, and then they get into it. We, you know, we, if you, it's, it's prime real estate, but it's, it's right after your first preamble, right? When you, you sort of set the first. stage. You need to hook, then add, or no add? I'd go right add. into it. Just depends how a type of an audience you have. So, yeah. you know, I, I think they're all a little different. Um, you, you talk about podcasting. We, we power, actually, the, our tech powers the largest podcasting agency. It's actually a division of ours called Veritone One. So we, we, actually, okay. we actually manage this, the ad spend for about 25% of all podcast ad dollars in the U.S. So we're, we're kind of experts on, on the podcast. you're podcasting. analyzing through artificial intelligence... What's yeah? What Podcast. what show? What shows working? What's not working? Um, we analyze the audience. We analyze the okay. not just when the ad is spoken, but how you're saying it. You know, and so all these all the when you when you when you look in rears of, of billions of dollars of spend, then it really gives us a competitive advantage to say we know what's working, we know what's not working. And so, what's the correlation with AWS? They provide the some of the the power behind it the there the there are, ma are for media and entertainment and advertising mm -hmm. you know a, what which is a major portion of our business there are primary cloud provider so our tech stack which we call aiware mm -hmm. um, is is platform agnostic but the, um, one of our main cloud providers where we deploy this technology is on aws and in aws um, obviously allows us to hyperscale so if we want to scale up and and ingest you know, thousands of streams one day and throttle down and do 50 streams the next day, of, right? Having a, a partner like AWS to manage that type of scale up and down is critical. And, and they're international, right? So, we, you know, we have an international business. AWS has points of presence, you know, I think now over 200 points of presence around the world. So they are a, a critical back-end partner of ours, really on the compute and storage side. What's the most exciting application that you've seen recently? You know, we do a lot of work with the entertainment industry, um, not just with the movie studios and broadcasters, but with a lot of the big talent agencies directly. Um, for many of us, you know, we're, at least in the United States, particularly in California, we're all aware of the recent Screen Actors Guild strikes, the Writers Guild mm -hmm. strikes. Um, you know, one of the things that was of, uh, on the table that they wanted clarity, they wanted rules and governance around was AI. Um, and so, you know, we, are, are very bullish about when, you know, and when you're making a movie, um, it's very expensive to get Tom Hanks to come back into a production facility to do a retake. It's very expensive to get Tom Hanks, if he is even willing to do it, to come in and do another voiceover because he garbled his lines, right? Um, with the technology is at a point now where I believe that there's gonna be a digital twin writer in every production contract. So when Tom Hanks comes in, he can choose to opt out and say, nope, can't make a synthetic version of my voice or my face. Um, but I think you're going to see 
uh, now a lot more utilization of that. So Tom can approve via director through his agent saying, you can use a synthetic version of my voice. I need to approve it, but you can use it for, let's say, post-production and editing purposes only, right? And, and that's gonna be stipulated. So I think you know, so, a lot of this generative AI stuff, we're talking about chat GBT and all these other things, I think synthetic voices, synthetic you know, versions of your face, the whole, you, you are gonna have to figure out how to manage your digital persona. Yeah. yeah. I understand and I think our, really our Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger's been really aggressive on that, using his voice, his synthetic voice, because yeah. his voice has changed since he was doing Terminator, but he's... We've done a lot of uh, legacy estate projects. So um, we actually okay. built, working with the estate of Walter Cronkite. Oh. Um, so we actually built his synthetic voice, you know, to do... Um, not, not not necessarily a lot of new content, but remastering stuff, right? Footage that was just too grainy, the audio was garbled. We can, if you will, remaster it with synthetic voice. Uh, Vin Scully, who recently passed away, this, the legendary sports broadcaster, you know, we created a version of his voice. But you touched on something that's really interesting is it, it's all about when you're, it, it's the training data to build a voice. If I capture Vin's voice when he was in 40s, his voice definitely sounds different than when he was mm -hmm. 80. Yes. And, and every personality, they have a preference, right? Um, and we actually went through and it, like if you ask Mr. Scully when was, where, you know, what was your prime? Not just how you were calling games, but the sound of your voice, right? He'll tell you his early 60s. So you have to think about, oh, you have to think about this is when you're creating a digital voice of somebody, kind of like the, where you're talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, what, you know what, what, what age do you want him to be? Not just the way he looks, but the sound of his voice and tone of his voice. So I think those are pretty interesting, exciting, you know, things that, that are gonna cause a lot of disruption, but I think it's, okay. you know, it's, it's, it's exciting times. You mentioned earlier how you all are working even outside of the media industry with uh, police forces. Maybe share a little bit about yep. that. So we started meeting entertainment, um, and because of our expertise, again, of ingesting large amounts of audio and video data, um, the federal government kind of found us and said, hey, you know, we're dealing with lots of audio and video. And completely different use cases, but it, again, it starts with, we're, you know, we have lots of drone footage, or satellite imagery, or police calls, or jailhouse calls. You know, everybody, because of how cheap storage has gotten digitally, and because of the cloud, everybody's producing content, right? Even groups that don't know what to do with all this data or content that they're mm -hmm. creating. There's no, it, the same goes for state and local law enforcement, same goes for Fed Civ like the DOJ, and the same goes for the DOD. So state and local law enforcement, which we've, we all have kind of seen either direct or through on television is body cameras and dash cams. So when your cars, if you've seen all the, the, you know, the footage online when somebody's being pulled over, and they're now capturing that on video and audio, everything. That's, it, we see that, but that's, it's creating a tremendous amount of unstructured audio, of audio and video data. We help them ingest, index, and organize all that. So, the, so the, it, whether it's being used for as part of the investigation, so if they're attempting to prosecute or clear the respective suspect, we've now turned all that just raw tonnage of audio and video into something that's very easy to search through and, and Okay, so you're indexing it, yeah. but you're doing it at such a detailed level. Correct. That you can, they can find things that is like a needle in a haystack before. Spot on. Like and and then and then and then which something we didn't foresee when we started. We launched this with police forces. Was um, it's called FOIA requests, Freedom of Inf Information Act. This is right. getting the content out to the public. Mm -hmm. But before you do that, I actually have to hide certain things. Right, so there's no PII information. You know, like when you see people's faces that are blurred in the background, that's like a, that, old cops. Old cops. That's an incredibly laborious process when a human's having to do that, like and blur the people's faces. So another, like a, a kind of an inverse of trying to find the person in the video is actually to find a person and hide their face programmatically, so a human doesn't have to go frame by frame, right, and, and hide any PII personal identifiable information from it. So. It's, um, it, 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 it creates a level of transparency, mm. right, out there. And, and um, that's kind of kind of goes into our theme is, you know, AI for good, right? How are we, we're, we're deploying all these technologies, we're making a good business out of it, but are we, are we moving the, the society forward by implementing these technologies? So you've mentioned some really cool, exciting things about AI and what you're doing. On, on the other, other side of it, what have you seen 
That's the scariest scary. thing. I don't think we've seen the scariest things yet. So I'll kind of put that out there. Um, you know, these, these machines are getting so powerful. Um, you know, they're, they're getting close to a, some, you know, some synthetic version of self-awareness, right? And I think we're, we're going to see, we're, gonna, we're all going to live through, you know, us figuring out how to put guardrails on some of these larger, more powerful models. Um, practically, I think it's, it's just protecting your family and your kids when, you know, people are using, you know, you're, you're here, you probably have heard of like spoof voices, right? To try to, oh, it's your grandmother calling. Can you come meet me around the corner? Like, so there, there's, there's, there's bad actors out there that are using a lot of these technologies to impersonate other people. And they're using it to fraudulently, you know, take, you know, access bank accounts, you know, use it as authentication uh, fraudulently. Um, and in some instances, it's, it's, you know, direct fraud where they're, you know, it's, you're, they're impersonating somebody else to send them money. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's, I like to say is AI is like fire, right? Fire is incredibly beneficial, powerful. We cook things. It's right. It for sanitary purposes. And, but at the same time, as you know, fire was the most terrifying thing that anybody could possibly imagine in certain areas. So it's, a, it's a tool and it's, again, it's how it's being utilized and leveraged. So AI is, I think, no different, right? So from your company standpoint, how are you thinking about cybersecurity? Because you've got so much data yeah. and there's so much power behind it. How, how are you? So how are you, it, let's say it's a huge investment that all of us, you know, I think you're going to see the percentage of capital expenditure that we have every year as a percentage of our revenue is unfortunately going to have to increase <laughs> for security and compliance. Yeah. I think it's just, it's table stakes. Um, you know, we, um, you know, as we put more and more into the cloud, right, as I, as we're doing more and more things online, by default, people are going to try to attack those systems. Particularly for us, when I, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with, let's say, you know, for, Fortune 500 M&E customers, and also mission critical public sector clients, security, and, you know, cyber security and many forms of security is, is critical. Um, you know, we all, as an inter, as a separate independent company, we obviously have our own efforts for security and compliance to protect our data sets, to protect our assets, to 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 protect um, you know fraudulent access and misappropriated authentication. But we applaud partners like AWS who also have that equal or more right. I mean, they understand how many workflows and businesses are running on AWS, and so them knowing that that's the, that's their bar is so high when we deploy workloads um, on AWS, whether it's AWS commercial or AWS gov, you know, we, we, we have confidence and that, that we're going to be protected. So it is a, it is a very high importance. I mean, we've had some, you know, horror stories from, you know, the hearing from, you know, around us that, you know, data sets are being ripped off and they're being held for ransom and all these different things. So thankfully we haven't had any of these security breaches yet. Um, but you know, it, it is a big concern and we, we, you know, we have a whole dedicated team internal that, that manages this. Um, but again, it's not just us, thankfully that's fighting this war. You know, we have partners like CrowdStrike and partners like AWS who, you know, collectively, you know, I think gives us a, a minimum layer of protection that, that is satisfactory. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see like who owns, who's responsible for the data security. So uh, the, the police force, they're capturing it in the body cam, but then they've got you processing it, right, and indexing it. Right. And then you're making it available, but sure. you know, who really is responsible ultimately for that cybersecurity when both parties are really into the data deep? Yeah, and when, and any, and when the data has to be transferred, right? So those connection points, yeah. right, are, are always creates vulnerabilities that people try to you know take advantage of or expose. So um, there's workloads that are a whole nother level of security, as you can imagine, right? We're when what we do in the DoD space, we're not at the top secret level today of what. Um, but let's just say that you know some of the data sets that we're responsible for of helping organize and index and understand, you know, are they're definitely have implications of national security, and and so you know you you wake up and you're like, geez, this is not just about making a buck serving an ad. But my systems need to. You've come you know, a long way from yeah, that. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, a lot of AI companies. I mean, if you, if you look at all the titans out there, I mean, all the big guys, you can map back to an ad tech background, right? You think about it. Like, why? I'm like, I'm having to process so much information so fast. 
I have to evaluate you as the person wanting, like you're requesting the content, mm -hmm. and then I have to evaluate what you're looking at, right? Trying to do this pure, purely algorithmic me between before we could start deploying neural networks was nearly impossible, right? And so there's a reason why Google and some of the leading ad tech companies now are the also the titans of AI. So you can you can thank yeah, ad can tech for your, that. Yeah, that stupid see. banner ad that we all hated, <laughs> the 468 by 60 pixel ad. This is the new was version. the precursor to the demand for AI. How about that? Yeah, well, th that's pretty interesting to think <laughs> about. So I, I recently saw something you posted about the Big Ten and, and, and how I'm curious how NIL, artificial intelligence, and sports and sports footage. Yeah, how was all that intersecting? Well, I think thankfully we we kind of fell into that one right a little bit. We weren't premeditating the NIL side, but. Um, you know, we, in addition to some of the other media and entertainment customers out there, we do help manage and organize a lot of the audio and video assets for a lot of the conferences. So NCAA is a big customer, the Big Ten, Pac-12, and others. Um, and so what specifically we do with the Big Ten is, you know, anything that's a, an official Big Ten game, um, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously that includes the conference championships, all that footage, that IP ownership is actually owned by the the conference not the schools right nor right. is it nor is the content owned the, the, by the broadcast the regular season games or just the championship game regular season games too okay yeah all, right. all of them um and, the, and the, so when when the rules change for student athletes to be able to start to monetize and profit from their name and likeness mm -hmm. being able to do commercials and right um a, it's such a, a, a major component of their assets is them playing on the field, yeah, right? Catching a pass. Exactly. Yeah. So if I'm building a commercial and I want to highlight Caleb Williams from USC, you know, and they want to they want to do a campaign, they obviously would like to potentially have access to him playing in the games. Um, so after a, a, you know a few years of trying to make sure we we can understand all the approvals and rights clearances. You know, we were proactive and said, let's 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 build a program working in coordination with the Big Ten. So student athletes have confidence that they know a price point and everything that if they if a brand comes to them or a sponsor, it's the local car dealer that wants to do an activation with the starting quarterback for the for one of the teams that here is pre approved footage, right, that we've already indexed that they can pull that from. they can pull. Oh, okay. And and it's it's all pre and cleared. They have to, you know, and, and since it's going through us as a clearinghouse, it's all tracked, right? So we start to bring some, I say, organization around it. So we're just making it it's easier for brands and student athletes to activate and leverage footage of them playing in the games, in as part of as part of advertising campaigns. So you've got roughly what six hundred employees, five hundred, about seven fifty, seven fifty. So. Good sized company, but you're describing things that you're heading off in a lot of different directions. You've got a lot of things going on. Yeah. How as a CEO, how are you prioritizing where to deploy these tools and where to really where to focus your yeah. team and organization? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you build a Swiss Army knife from a technology stack, right? Some of the the hardest thing is focus. Um, we're we focus, you know, our technology. Thankfully, the technology is very extensible, so I don't need a lot of configuration or changes to this tech stack. So when I'm when I'm servicing an end customer like state and local law enforcement or media and entertainment, most of the core tenants of data ingest indexing, it's roughly the same. So from a technology perspective, I get some efficiencies, get some efficiencies of scale there. Um, it's the go to market is the big challenge, right? And so the way we've set it up as an organization is. Um, I have a dedicated general manager, almost runs it as a separate business unit, where the, for media and entertainment, since the technology may be similar, but the use cases are so radically different, um, that, that we really have dedicated marketing, sales, and product marketing at a minimum that are very focused on those verticals. So if I'm selling and how I'm selling to a movie studio is radically different than selling to a police chief. Right. So, and so, so think Unless of it, it's a TV show yeah, about yeah. a police chief. There we go. And then you Unless do, okay. Right. So for us, we've at least chosen to do more of a, a siloed general manager vertical approach where we have some shared services, finance, HR, you know, accounts payable, stuff like that. IT, global IT. 
But as it relates to go to market for you know marketing, sales, field sales, SDRs, um, we have dedicated teams against the, th- the three big verticals we're in, media and entertainment, pl- public sector, we can talk a lot about it, but we do a lot in HR and hiring as well. And so we have a dedicated, so I have, one, I have, I have three GMs that manage okay. those different business lines for okay. us. Okay, and so sort of rounding it out, yeah. how does that, how are you guys interacting with HR? So on the HR side, we, you know, we, we looked at this uh, as, as a major data problem. So as people are going more remote and people are capturing interviews right through Zoom, so you know, if you at the end of the day, you know, Amazon's a big customer of ours, not on the ADO, ADO so, but we help a lot, do a lot of the hiring for Amazon um, through our software. Um, but it's a data problem. It's really interesting. Um, you know that you know each each company has open job recs in in like Workday or another application. Yep. If they, so they've been creating data about not only about but once you've been hired, but people I'm trying to hire, and then as people are going through the interview and hiring process there's data being produced, conversations that are being had. Is it a taped interview on video? So we're helping, in effect, in, ingest and organize all that disparate data, and then, in effect, making it more efficient, not only for the candidate trying to get through the process, but you know, our, our, and say our, main, our main attention is focused on the hiring company to, that, to, to ultimately help them find the right candidate faster, cheaper, Right in a more timely manner. So you're evaluating their interview, everything, of the conversations they're having, and um, you're and you're picking up on what in those interviews. It, it, well, some of them are obvious, right? There, so you know, you can look at exclusionary questions, right? That that we feel or the the company feels are red flags, right? Maybe it's you know when they're at when they go into a series of questions about culture, right? Do they feel that that's not going to necessarily be a right fit for how they view the world, right? Um, not, not so much as Are you um, feeding them questions to ask the person being interviewed. Not, not in. It's a good question. Right. Not live in real time, but that's where it's going. So, so much so that we. If they you know, say this. Yeah, they say so. I'll say pr- progressive conversational AI. Exactly. Um, now, the state of New York, and, and this is kind of goes back to, you know, our efforts for AI for good. A lot of concerns about what I just described, right? About bias, et cetera, inclusion. Yeah. Um, and so we had to go through a pretty laborious audit process that the software it, it inherently is not biased, right? When you're going through, you know, when you're turning an interview into a more of a programmatic execution, it makes perfect sense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so thankfully we passed, um, but, um, but those, are, those are things that, again, we need, we need to think about. It's all, they're all a little different in the different verticals, but, but thinking about inclusion, Thinking about diversity, thinking about bias, these are all critical things that you that you know AI. You hear about it, the, the the downside and concerns about AI. They're real. Some of them are very very real, and you got to make sure you build the right guardrails around those. Well, how do you believe regulation, government regulation, should be uh, intertwined? Um, I think there, like many t- many instances, when you've seen this radical shift or innovation curve advance so quickly, legislation is always lags, right? Always. Um, particularly in this hyper frenetic environment of generative AI, where you have titans, you know, advancing these models so quickly, legislation is, is trying to catch up. So um, I think that there needs to be, particularly as it relates to the, the utilization of AI as an, when it touches us, whether it's, you know, ad targeting or uh, I'm talking to Alexa, right? Is Alexa capturing my voice, right? What are they going to do with that data set? I think legislation um, and and different jurisdictions should be heavily involved in making sure that that the right processes and protocols are followed to make sure that a lot of these new you know, technology solutions um, are safe. And y- y- I think, it, again, it's going to take time. So I don't think that we're, I mean, we're all going to figure this out in real time because nobody's slowing the AI wave, for example. It's going to happen. Um, there's going to be more carnage. There's going to be a lot of good things happening, but there's going to be carnage. Um, you know, I mean, look what President Biden just did, right? He just put out his executive order. That's 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 a start, right? It's going to take a very long Super. time for those components to get you know put in, but but some are obvious. I mean, you know, if, I mean, if I'm pulling somebody over, and I'm using AI to do you know demographic uh, you know social you know uh, racial profiling, for example. 
and then that if that somehow is going to be used downstream, there sh needs to be regulation around that, right? Um, some let's not let's not let's not do regulation where there doesn't really need to be, right? I mean, there's a lot of uses of AI, you know, for auto word fill, for example. If I'm typing in a search query and it, based upon me, my preference, it automatically fills in right my query for me. Do I need that to be regulated, right? So I I, I just want to uh, you know our concern is certain groups may be ignorant in understanding everything that the AI can and cannot do. So an easy decision is throw it all out, right? It's banned completely and then let it leak in. By the way, that's, that's, a, the that's, that's a policy some groups, some, some jurisdiction municipalities are taking saying, you know, AI and machine learning, for example, it cannot be used at all hmm. by, let's say, municipalities or the city categorically and then you have to apply to get back in, right? So there's different, yeah. you know, there, I mean, you go to a different, and as you know, the way our laws and you know, jurisdictions are mapped, as you can appreciate, in some areas, the city has a lot of authority in these rules. Some, it's the county, some it's the state, and some are overreaching federal. So just like many other things is, I think the governance around AI is gonna be messy as it matures as we mature using this What tech. are the questions that leaders need to be asking themselves right now to take advantage of the opportunity that, that AI presents? I think first is they have to evaluate what's the impact to society? What's the impact to the, to the laborer, the, the staff or the worker? Um, what's the impact to consumer or individual privacy? I think they're just, you know, whether it's how the, the AI is applying when I'm watching a TV show or I'm applying for a job, I think they, they we need to understand, you know, are, are we putting our people, our populace at risk, right? What do we need to do as a governing body to protect the individual? Um, and some of them, it's binary. Are we going to be, you know, do we really understand how many jobs this may eliminate in the future, right? Um, you know, businesses, we are designed and we are motivated to try to increase profits, and if I could do something more efficiently and, and potentially execute those functions with less employees, I make more money, right? So how do I balance that with, you know, we talked about the lag of legislation and, and I'd say regulation following AI. What about retraining people, right? So if, if whole categories of jobs may be impaired or eliminated, you know, people can't upskill or get educated to shift into a new career in six months, right? So that's the other, the concern is not just the the onset of AI, it's the speed. The speed. That's it, happening. And the acceleration of the ex it. Exactly, and it's, you're right, we're, it's still accelerating. So how, how does the populace react? So I think again, I, you know, I think they need to ask, you know, and then evaluate, like, is this, you know, you know, I mean, there's a lot of good things, like, is this, you know, if we're gonna empower our police force with AI, you know, is, is this, is this going to help bring more transparency and trust back into the ecosystem that we may have lost? Or is this going to, you know, potentially go the wrong direction? And then you're going to have, a, you know, a lot of groups saying, hey, listen, our, you know, I represent, you know, this, this group. And, and I think it's creating a, an unfair bias, you know. And so I, I just, I think ultimately it is, at least in our country, right, it's about us, the people. And I think they need to ask those questions about, is it going to you know harm mm -hmm. my citizens and what other quite you know and what else do, what else do I need to understand about this problem to make sure that if I have to vote on this right and that's why people are terrified am I am I going to be approving something yeah. that's going to have a detrimental effect against my voting base <laughs> down the yeah. road and they may not know yeah and they may not know and they're just so starting to land the plane here on this you 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 shared at a leadership level how leaders need to think about it now coming zooming in on a personal level sure what do you recommend people think about what are maybe reading listening to yeah. that's helpful for them to sort of wrap their minds around what's coming with ai on a personal level you know th thankfully for you know although i think you know the 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 bomb dropped when chat gbt was released right and and <laughs> I, I think everyone i know is Right, it's a yeah, it's a classic that, period yeah. of moment in time, and yeah. you know I think first is people need to experience and play with these tools. People need to be educated. I mean, this is a you know this is the digital divide all over again. Right, I'll call it the AI divide. The tools yeah. we, uh, 
you know, OpenAI chose to open this up, right? Google's been sitting on, right, GPT large language models for years, right? And they chose mm -hmm. Apple has mm -hmm. arguably the best AI out there, but they didn't open it up. Um, this is a chance for people to get educated. So I, I encourage everybody, you know, again, to just you know, don't put a personal information when you're doing a prompt and stuff like this, but learn the tools. They're available to everybody. There, there's free versions of all these tools out there. Every person should understand what chat, chat GPT means, right? Anybody who, you know, teachers obviously should, students, right? I'm not telling them to plagiarize a book, right? But they need to understand these tools. So ed education, and education is challenging. You gotta get your hands on. Um, so I highly encourage you know, individuals to do that. Second is, you know, look at, evaluate your career. Where do you think you're going, right? You know, when the, the, if this is that big of a moment in time, do you think about what else you need to do in terms of education or preparing yourself for your future career? So if I'm in copywriting, for example, and I'm picking an area where it's being advertised as one area that could be mostly impacted, do I want to bet the farm on my career being a copywriter, right? Well, maybe I do, but why don't I become an, you know, an expert and an assisted copywriter, meaning I know the tools better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So you're hiring me not just for my an ad copy that I'm writing, but you know that I know how to use the tools that make me better, right? So they're nuanced. Yeah. I'll give you a quote. A, a good friend of mine, um, uh, uh, Dave McKenna, um, is the cinematographer, I mean, sorry, the screenwriter that did like American History X and a bunch of okay. movies. Right. Um, and, you know, he, I, I was always, you know, asking him, I'm getting asked about the AI. I'm talking to him. He's part of this, the Writers Guild. We're going back and forth. It's a great dialogue. Mm. And you know, let's just say he views, if there's 11,000 roughly uh, more or less members of the Writers Guild, I point blank ask him, like, how many are there gonna be in five years, right? And I'm not giving you the exact number, put them on record, but it's gonna be less than it is today. And, and, and so you're, you're gonna have the haves and the haves nots, those who are embracing these tools and knowing how to use them. Um, mm -hmm. And then those others that, you know, I mean, There'll always be a market if you if you want Leonardo DiCaprio to you know do your show and he's never willing to give you you know digital versions of his voice, he's still gonna have a good job. But I, you're, you're, I think you're gonna see a separation of people who are embracing and becoming experts using these tools to accelerate their careers and those that say absolutely not. And I think I think they're gonna have a harder time in the future. Ryan, thanks for coming on CXA Revolutionaries. Thank it's you. a lot Appreciate of fun it. today, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for the time.